Oliver's no use at all, thinks he's very clever, says that he can manage us, that's the best joke ever. When he orders us about with the greatest folly, we just push him down the well. Pop goes all Ollie. Every day, Sir Topham Hatt came to the station to catch his train. Hello, he always said to Thomas. Don't let the silly freight cars tease you. Remember, you have an important job as a special helper in the train yard. There were lots of freight cars, and Thomas worked very hard pushing and pulling them into place. There was also a small coach, and two strange things his driver called cranes. That's the breakdown train, he told Thomas. The cranes are for lifting heavy things, like engines and coaches and freight cars. One day, Thomas was in the yard. Suddenly, he heard an engine whistling. Help! Help! A freight train came rushing through much too fast. The engine was James, and he was frightened. His brake blocks were on fire. They're pushing me, they're pushing me, he panted. On, on, laughed the freight cars. Still whistling, help, help. Poor James disappeared. I'd like to teach those freight cars a lesson, said Thomas the tank engine. Soon came the alarm. James is off the line, the breakdown train, quickly. Thomas was coupled on and off they went. Thomas worked his hardest. Hurry, 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 he puffed. He wasn't pretending to be like Gordon. He really meant it. Bother those freight cars and their tricks. I hope poor James isn't hurt. James's driver and fireman were feeling him all over to see if he was hurt. Never mind, James, they said. It was those silly freight cars and your old wooden brakes that caused the accident. Thomas pushed the breakdown train alongside. Then he pulled away the unhurt freight cars. Oh dear, oh dear, they groaned. Serves you right, serves you right, puffed Thomas. He was hard at work puffing backwards and forwards all afternoon. This'll teach you a lesson, this'll teach you a lesson, he told the freight cars. And they answered, yes it will, yes it will. They left the broken cars, then with two cranes they put James back on the rails. He tried to move, but he couldn't, so Thomas helped him back to the shed. Sir Topham Hatt was waiting anxiously for them. Well, Thomas, he said. I've heard all about it, and I'm very pleased with you. You're a really useful engine. James shall have some proper brakes and a new coat of paint. And you shall have a branch line all to yourself. Oh, thank you, sir, said Thomas. Now Thomas is as happy as can be. He has a branch line and two coaches called Annie and Clarabelle. He puffs proudly backwards and forwards with them all day. He is never lonely. Edward and Henry stop quite often and tell him the news. Gordon is always in a hurry, but never forgets to say boop, boop, and Thomas always whistles beep, beep in return.
James had not been out to push coaches or freight cars in the yard for several days. He was feeling miserable. Oh, dear. I wonder how long I shall have to stay in the shed. Will anyone ever see my red coat again? Why did I go so fast that I made a hole in one of my coaches that had to be mended with, of all things, a passenger's boot lace? At last, Sir Topham had arrived. I know you're sorry, James, and I know, too, that you want to be a useful engine. People are laughing at my railway, and I do not like that at all. I will try hard to do my best, said James. That's a good engine. There's nothing like determination. I want you to pull some freight cars for me. James was delighted and puffed away. Here's your freight train, James, said Thomas. Have you got some bootlaces ready? And he ran off laughing. Oh, no, said the freight cars. We want a proper engine, not a red monster. James took no notice and started as soon as the conductor was ready. Come along, come along, he puffed. We won't, we won't, screamed the freight cars. But James didn't care, and he pulled the screeching cars sternly out of the station. Cars tried hard to make him give up, but he still kept on. Sometimes their brakes would slip on, and sometimes their axle would run hot. And each time, the trouble had to be put right. And each time, James would start again, determined not to let them beat him. Give up, give up, you can't pull us. You can't, you can't, called the cars. I can and I will, I can and I will, puffed James. And slowly but surely, he pulled them along the line. At last, they saw Gordon's Hill. Look out for trouble, James, warned his driver. We'll go fast and get them up before they know it. Don't let them stop you. So James went faster. Soon they were halfway up. I'm doing it. I'm doing it, he panted. Will the top never come? Then, with a sudden jerk, it all came easier. I've done it! I've done it! Hooray! It's easy now! But his driver shut off steam. They've done it again! We've left our tail behind! Look! The last cars were running backwards down the hill. The coupling had snapped. But the conductor stopped the cars and got out to warn approaching engines. That's why it was easy, said James, as he backed the other cars carefully down. What silly things freight cars are! There might have been an accident. Should I help you, James? called Edward. No, thank you. I'll pull them myself. Good. Don't let them beat you. You're doing well, whistled Edward, as James slowly struggled up the hill. I can do it. I can do it, he puffed. He pulled and puffed as hard as he could. I've done it. I've done it, he panted. James was resting in the yard when Edward pulled up. Beep, beep, he whistled. Then James saw Sir Topham Hatt. Oh, dear, what will he say, he asked himself. But Sir Topham Hatt was smiling. I was in Edward's train, and I saw everything. You've made the most troublesome train on the line behave. After that performance, you deserve to keep your red coat. <laughs> Toby and Henrietta were enjoying their new job on the island of Sodor, but they do look old-fashioned and did need new paint. James was very rude whenever he saw them. Yuck! What dirty objects, he would say. At last, Toby lost patience. James, he asked, why are you red? 
I am a splendid engine, answered James, ready for anything. You never see my paint dirty. Oh, said Toby innocently. That's why you once needed bootlaces, to be ready, I suppose. James went redder than ever and snorted off. It was such an insult to be reminded of the time a bootlace had been used to mend a hole in his coaches. At the end of the line, James left his coaches and got ready for his next train. It was a slow freight, stopping at every station to pick up and set down cars. James hated slow freight trains. Dirty cars from dirty siding. Yeah! Starting with only a few, he picked up more and more cars at each station till he had a long train. At first, the freight cars behaved well, but James bumped them so crossly that they were determined to get back at him. Presently, they approached the top of Gordon's Hill. Heavy freight trains halt here to set their brakes. James had had an accident with cars before and should have remembered this. Wait, James, wait, said the driver, but James wouldn't wait. He was too busy thinking what he would say to Toby when they next met. The freight car's chance had come. Hurrah, hurrah, they laughed, and banging their buffers, they pushed him down the hill. On, on, yelled the cars. I've got to stop, I've got to stop grown James. Disaster lay ahead. Something sticky splashed all over James. He had run into two tar wagons and was black from smoke box to cad. He was more dirty than hurt. But the tar wagons and some cars were all to pieces. Toby and Percy were sent to help and came as quickly as they could. Look here, Percy, exclaimed Toby. Whatever is that dirty object? That's James, didn't you know? It's James's shape, said Toby. But James is a splendid red engine, and you never see his paint dirty. James pretended he hadn't heard. Toby and Percy cleared away the unhurt cars and helped James home. Sir Topham Hatt met them. Well done, Percy and Toby. He turned to James. Fancy letting your cars run away. I am surprised. You're not fit to be seen. You must be cleaned at once. Toby shall have a new coat of paint. Please, sir, can Henrietta have one too? Said Toby. Certainly, Toby. Oh, thank you, sir. She will be pleased. All James could do was watch Toby as he ran off happily with the news. One day, Henry wanted to rest, but Percy was talking to some engines. He was telling them about the time he had braved bad weather to help Thomas. It was raining hard. Water swirled under my boiler. I couldn't see where I was going, but I struggled on. Oh, Percy, you are brave! Well, it wasn't anything, really. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Tell us more, Percy. What are you engines doing here? Hissed Henry. This shed is for Sir Topham Hatt's engines. Go away. Silly things, Henry snorted. They're not silly. 
Percy had been enjoying himself. They are silly, and so are you. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Huh. Anyway, said Cheeky Percy, I'm not afraid of water. I like it. He ran off to the harbor singing. Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. No one ever lets me forget the time I wouldn't come out of the tunnel in case the rain spoiled my paint, huffed Henry. Thomas was looking at the board on the key. Danger. We mustn't go past it, he said. That's orders. Why? Danger means falling down something, said Thomas. I went past danger once and fell down a mine. I can't see a mine, said Percy. He didn't know that the foundations of the key had sunk. The rails now sloped downward to the sea. Stupid board, said Percy. He made a plan. One day, he whispered to the cars, will you give me a bump when we get to the key? The cars had never been asked to bump an engine before. They giggled and chatted about it. Driver doesn't know my plan, chuckled Percy. On, 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 laughed the cars. Percy thought they were helping. I'll pretend to stop at the station, but the cars will push me past the board. Then I'll make them stop. I can do that whenever I like. Every wise engine knows you cannot trust freight cars. Go on, go on, they yelled and bumped Percy's driver and fireman off the footplate. Ow, said Percy, sliding past the board. Percy was frantic. That's enough! Percy was sunk. You are a very disobedient engine. Percy knew that voice. Please, sir, get me out, sir. I'm truly sorry, sir. No, Percy, we cannot do that till high tide. I hope it will teach you to take care of yourself. Yes, sir. It was dark when they brought floating cranes to rescue Percy. He was too cold and stiff to move by himself. Next day, he was sent to the works on Henry's freight train. Well, 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 chuckled Henry. Did you like the water? No. I am surprised. You need more determination, Percy. Water's nothing to an engine with determination, you know. Perhaps you will like it better next time. Percy is quite determined that there won't be a next time. <laughs> On a clear day when the sky is blue and there's just enough breeze to blow the clouds away, you can stand on the big hill above the valley and watch Duck and Oliver far below, busily at work on Duck's branch line near the sea. The two engines are very proud of their matching coats of gleaming color. Oliver often talks about the time that Douglas saved him from scrap. If it wasn't for his help, Oliver will say, I might have been caught when I ran away from the scrapyard and I would never have come to live here on Sir Topham Hatt's railway. The other engines all wanted to know about Oliver's adventures. Amazing, remarked Henry. Oliver, said James, has resource. And sagacity, put in Gordon. What does that mean, whispered Percy. I think, replied Thomas, it's about being clever and wise. He is, finished Gordon, an example to us all. I'm sorry to say that Oliver became very puffed up in the smoke box. Henry says I'm amazing. He's right. He whistled as he swooshed along the line. One day, Sir Topham Hatt came to see him. 
You are doing well. Now you must learn how to look after freight cars. Every wise engine knows that you cannot trust freight cars. The other engines warned Oliver, but he took no notice. You think I can't manage, he said, huffily. Gordon knows better. He says I'm sagacious. You may be good gracious, or whatever you call it, but cars can be troublesome, and... Say no more, Duck, interrupted Donald. It's a pity, but the wee engine will just have to learn for himself. Oliver pulled some loaded cars to a siding and pushed the empties to the chute. Then he came back to take the loaded cars away. But they were comfortable and didn't want to move. What right is he to poke his funnel in here? We want Duck! Or Donald! Or Douglas! Look sharp, huffed Oliver. That's not the way to speak, hissed the cars. We'll get even. Oliver heard nothing. The cars moved smoothly at first, then suddenly Oliver felt them push forward. His driver applied the brakes, but they were useless against the surging cars. On, 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 yelled the cars. Oliver fought hard, but still they forced him on and on. At last, the cars grew tired. I'm winning, gasped Oliver, but it was too late. Oliver lay bruised and bemused, bunker down in the turntable well. Duck surveyed the damage. Hello, Oliver. Are you being a good, gracious engine? Beg pardon, but we really don't like this sort of surprise. Donald and Douglas will miss their turntable until it is mended. That evening, Oliver was hauled gently to safety. I'm sorry, sir, he said to Sir Topham Hatt. I should have listened to Duck's advice. I don't feel good gracious or whatever it is. I just feel silly. Well, Oliver, replied Sir Topham Hatt, now you know the damage cars can do. Yes, I do, sir. I, I look like a load of scrap iron. Oh, I don't think so, laughed Sir Topham Hatt. But you do need to go to the works to be mended. The other engines now felt sorry for Oliver. The branch line won't be the same without you, Whistle Duck. Come back soon. A few days later, Oliver did come back. His coat gleamed brighter than ever. He was a wiser engine, too, and never made a mistake about cars again. Thomas the tank engine was feeling bright and cheerful. It was a splendid day. Good morning, he whistled to some cows, but the cows didn't reply. Never mind, said Thomas. They're busy with their breakfast. Next, he saw Bertie. Hello, Bertie. Care for a race today? But all Bertie could say was, Ouch! That's another hole in the road. I'm sorry, Bertie, smiled Thomas. Thomas was still in good spirits when Bertie arrived at the next station. Bad luck, Bertie. Now, if you were a steam engine, you would run on a pair of reliable rails. Huh, replied Bertie. The railway was supposed to deliver tar to mend the road two weeks ago. You can't trust a thing that runs on rails. I run on rails. You can trust me, Bertie. I'll see if I can find out what's happened. And Thomas puffed away towards the big station. James was snorting about in the yard. It's too bad, he grumbled. Percy goes to work at the harbor and I do his job. Here, there, and everywhere. Take that! Oh, groaned the freight cars. Just you wait. We'll show you. Gordon laughed. I'll tell you what, James. If you pretended to be ill everywhere, you couldn't shunt freight cars here or go to the quarry there, could you? 
What a good idea, agreed James. Look, here comes Thomas. I'll start pretending now. Thomas was sorry to see the engines looking miserable. Cheer up, he puffed. It's a beautiful day. Yes, grumbled Gordon, but not for James. What's the matter, asked Thomas. He's sick, replied Gordon. Yes, he is. I, I mean, I am, stuttered James. I don't feel well at all. Don't worry, said Thomas kindly. I'll help out if you're ill. Gordon and James snickered quietly to each other. Some of James's cars were coupled behind Thomas and he steamed away to the quarry. The cars were still cross. We couldn't pay James back for bumping us, so we'll play tricks on Thomas instead. One engine is as good as another. But Thomas didn't hear them. He collected all the stone from the quarry and set off back to the junction. Danger lay ahead. Now for our plan, giggled the cars. Go faster, go faster. They pushed Thomas over the switches. Slow down, called Thomas's driver and applied the brakes. <laughs> Poor Thomas stood dazed and surprised in a muddy pond as a toad eyed him suspiciously. Bust my buffers, muttered Thomas. The day started so well, too. Duck pulled away the cars and Edward helped Thomas back to the junction. Suddenly, Thomas remembered the missing tar. He told Edward all about it. That's strange, said Edward. A car full of tar has been left at my station. That must be it. Driver will make sure it gets to Bertie now. Later, James spoke to Thomas. I'm sorry about your accident, he muttered, and so is Gordon. We didn't mean to get you into trouble. No, indeed, spluttered Gordon. A mere misunderstanding, Thomas. All's well that ends well. Just then, Bertie arrived. He looked much more cheerful. My road's being mended now. Oh, I am glad, replied Thomas. Thanks for all you did, added Bertie. Now I know I can trust an engine, especially if his name is Thomas. Gordon and James puffed silently away to the shed. But Thomas still had company. Well, well, he sighed. What a day for surprises. The toad, who was looking forward to a ride home, noisily agreed. Oliver had been to the works to be mended. Some troublesome cars tricked him, and the great western engine fell into the turntable well. Now Oliver was as good as new, but he was still worried about cars. I'd rather not use them, he puffed to himself. But the cars sang songs rude and loud. Scruffy, their leader, led the chorus. Oliver's no use at all, thinks he's very clever. Says that he can manage us, that's the best joke ever. When he orders us about with the greatest folly, we just push him down the well. Pop goes old Ollie. Thomas, Duck, and Percy were shocked. Be quiet, they ordered. But they couldn't be everywhere, and everywhere they weren't, the cars began again. Oliver's no use at all, thinks he's very clever. Says that he can manage us, that's the best joke ever. At last, the engines gave up. We're sorry, Oliver, they said. It's really my fault, said Oliver sadly. I shouldn't have fallen in the turntable well. Toad, the brake van, felt sorry for Oliver too. Next morning, he spoke to Douglas. I'm worried, Mr. Douglas. This disrespect for engines, where is it going to end? Who knows, sighed Douglas. I've got a plan, Mr. Douglas. May I stay here today and help Mr. Oliver? We are both Great Western and must stand together. Certainly, Toad, replied Douglas and puffed away. Soon Toad was explaining his plan. 
Goodness gracious, Toad, I don't think you should suggest such a thing to Oliver. But Oliver interrupted. No, Duck, Toad's right. It's really my fault. I must put this trouble right. I meant no disrespect, you understand. Of course not, Toad. Anyway, Driver says the same, and he's arranged it with the station master. Very well, Oliver, conceded Duck. But I must hurry. My passengers will be waiting. Good luck. So long, smiled Oliver bravely. But he felt dreadfully nervous inside. Oliver marshaled the worst cars two by two. That's the way, Mr. Oliver, whispered Toad. And if you leave that scruffy to last, then you'll have him behind you. And you can bump him if he starts his nonsense. Hold back, hold back, whispered Scruffy, and pass the word to the others. The silly cars giggled. But Oliver knew what to do. There was plenty of sand on the rails and his wheels gripped splendidly. He gave a great heave. <gasps> groaned Scruffy. I don't like this. Go on, yelled Duff. Well done, boy, well done. Oh! wailed Scruffy. I'm coming apart! And he did. Then there was trouble. Well, Oliver, so you don't know your own strength, is that it? N no, no, sir, said, said Oliver nervously. So Topham had inspected Scruffy. As I thought. Rotten wood, rusty frames. Maybe if we put you back together, you'll earn yourself a better name. Nowadays, Oliver only takes the cars when the other engines are busy. But they're always quick to warn each other. Take care with Mr. Oliver. If you play tricks on him, you'll never be the same car again. Scruffy has learned his lesson and says nothing at all. Every day where the little engines work, the crisp air is suddenly filled with a familiar noise. The lakes and mountains have many visitors, and Harold the helicopter flies the sky, making sure that no one is in trouble. All present and correct. Time to return to base. Then Harold noticed something. A sturdy diesel was coming round the mountain. Harold flew lower for a closer inspection. I'm Harold, who are you? I'm Rusty, replied the diesel. Don't recall seeing you before. What brings you this way? Sir Topham Hatt sent me to help the other engines, huffed Rusty. This was no time for a chat with a helicopter. Well done, cheers, and keep up the good work. Cheeky chopper, muttered Rusty. Not long now, encouraged the driver. We'll soon be at the top station. Peter, Sam, and Sir Handel were glad to see Rusty. Even so, Sir Handel wouldn't stop grumbling. The cars didn't like Sir Handel and wanted to play tricks on him. No one understands our feelings, sympathized Gordon. Now, if you were ill, you couldn't shunt cars, could you? Good idea, replied Sir Handel. I'll try it. He did so next morning. I don't feel well, he groaned. There wasn't time to examine him, so some of his cars were coupled behind Peter Sam's coaches. Rusty promised to follow with the rest. Peter Sam didn't mind the extra work. He left his coaches at the station and trundled cheerfully on. Soon they reached the quarry where the cars were needed. Empty cars at the bottom of the slope are hitched to a cable. Loaded ones at the top are hitched to another. By their weight, 
Loaded cars run down the steep slope, pulling the empty ones up. Peter Sam duly waited at the bottom of the slope for the loaded cars. He never bumped cars unless they misbehaved. But the loaded cars couldn't see him properly. They thought he was Sir Handel. Their chance for trickery had come. Faster! Faster! They yelled. No, no! wailed the empty cars. It's Peter Sam! But it was no use. Hurrah! Hurrah! roared the cars. Peter Sam shut his eyes. Peter Sam. Rusty was working nearby and came to help clear up the mess. Bust my buffers, exclaimed Rusty. Never mind, Peter Sam. We'll get you out. Peter Sam felt battered. His funnel was cracked and his boiler dented. Thank you, Rusty, he sighed and limped slowly home. I'm sorry about your accident, said Sir Handel. I always stand well back. Cars don't like me. Why didn't you warn me? I didn't think. You never do. You can start thinking now while you're doing Peter Sam's work as well as your own. That'll teach you to pretend you're ill. Sir Handel did start thinking about Gordon. When the wreckage was cleared away, Rusty set off along the line. Splendid to see you again, whizzed Harold. I'm completing my evening's lookabout. Well done. Cheers, and keep up the good work. And the little diesel purred back home. Percy puffed grumpily into the yards. He was feeling put upon and said so. I feel put upon, he complained to Thomas. Thomas was confused. Put upon what? The rails? No. Put upon with work. Driver says he is too. Put upon? What a silly saying, replied Thomas. But Annie and Clarabelle liked it, and they sang about it too. Percy's been put upon, put upon, put upon. Percy's been put upon, poor old Percy. Percy is being put upon. I am, I am, I am. He collected metal from the foundry, coal from the yards, flour from the mills, rock from the quarries, and fuel from the depot. Then he delivered it all to the docks. Next, he collected some empty freight cars Who's this dirty little engine? cried the freight cars. We want Thomas or Duck. Percy ignored them. Put upon, put upon, that's what I am. That night all the engines laughed at him. We can see what's been put upon you, said Thomas. Silence, said Sir Topham Hatt. Percy, you've done a good day's work. Now get a good night's rest. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Next morning, he took some freight cars to the coal yards. Then he had to push empty freight cars to the mine shaft. When he arrived, there was trouble. The foreman spoke to his driver. The freight cars are stuck on the mechanism. All they need is a good push. We'll do it right away. Percy shunted back to where a large canvas barrier was used to protect his line from loose rocks. Percy charged at the line of freight cars too fast and too hard. Oh no, gasped Percy. The freight cars broke free, but ran out of control to the mines below. On, on, faster, faster, the silly freight cars yelled. Then there was trouble again. Get out of here fast! The mine's collapsing!
We'll just have to make a run for it, Percy, called his driver. There's going to be an avalanche, wailed Percy. And he was right. Worse still, the track he was on began to crumble. Oh, help, wailed Percy. Then he remembered something he had seen earlier. There's a canvas barrier by the track. That might save us. They were just in time. Percy was right. The canvas did indeed save them, but the miners didn't know that. The avalanche has buried an engine and its crew, shouted the foreman. We must help them. When Percy had been rescued, Sir Topham Hatt spoke to his driver and fireman, then to Percy. Driver told me how brave you were, Percy. As a reward, you will be repainted at the works. Oh, thank you, sir. When he returned, Percy's coat glistened in the sun. I'm sorry we teased you, Percy, said Thomas. You were certainly put upon by that avalanche. Yes, indeed. But just look at my new coat of paint. Now, I don't mind that being put upon me. Toad the brake van was feeling sad. Everywhere he looked, he could see engines and coaches moving steadily forwards. They all looked confident and cheerful. One day, he decided to talk to Oliver, the great western engine. I'm always going backwards, Mr. Oliver. I have forward-thinking views. I could be a leader, if you know what I mean. You can't be a leader without a train to follow. You, you don't have a train, Gordon said. Toad felt sadder still. Oliver wanted to help. You're a very useful brake van, Toad. You help me brake, and you keep my freight cars in order when we go down hills. I know, Mr. Oliver, but it would be so exciting to go forwards for a change instead of always seeing things sliding away from me. The freight cars were cross with Toad. Who's he to start complaining? He's lucky to be able to look after us. Let's teach him a lesson. Freight cars decided to carry out their plan when they reached Gordon's Hill. When they were nearly at the top, they played their tricks. Ready, steady, go! And they jerked at a coupling, which broke. We're making your wish come true, Toad! Follow the leader, yelled the freight cars. Toad was still in a state of shock, so he didn't know what to think and he couldn't ask the conductor, he had jumped clear. Faster, faster, as fast as you want, screamed the freight cars. Suddenly, Toad found it fun. But the fun was soon over. A crossing lay ahead and the gates were closed. Toad couldn't stop. Worse still, Toad now realized he was on the wrong track. There ahead was Gordon. The signalman changed the points just in time. On, on, faster, cried the freight cars. Suddenly, he saw James pulling a long, slow train. Oh, my goodness! B help! Save me! A quick-thinking shunter did, just in time. What was that? exclaimed James. The signalman warned the station master at the next station. There's a runaway coming. We'll send him into the sidings. Help! Help! called Toad again. 
Toad saw some buffers. Those will stop me! But the points to the buffers weren't set. No, no! I'm back on the main line! Meanwhile, Oliver was racing to the rescue. I must catch Toad. I must! Toad sped past Henry. More danger lay ahead. Men were working on a bridge, but they had been warned about the runaway Toad and his freight cars. They diverted him onto old sidings, straight into a muddy pool. <laughs> Stopped at last! Oliver arrived, and when he saw Toad, he could only smile. A pond is the only place for a toad, I suppose. That night, Toad spoke to Oliver. I'm sorry, Mr. Oliver, if I caused you any embarrassment. That's all right, Toad. So what do you think of going forwards? It was fun, decided Toad. But from now on, I'll be happy to look forward to the future. Busy going backwards, so to speak. Engines on the island of Sodor like feeling responsible, reliable, and really useful. They work hard to complete their jobs on time. They don't like confusion and delay. But the troublesome trucks delight in mischief, and their mischief causes trouble, as poor Henry found out. Henry has had an accident and been sent for repairs, said Sir Topham Hatt. There are no other engines available, so diesel will help until Henry returns. Yes, sir, puffed the engines, but they weren't happy. The engines didn't like diesel. He was always being rude and always showing off. I hope Henry's mended soon, said Percy. He moves more trucks than three diesels put together, agreed Thomas. Trucks are no one's friends, huffed Gordon. The next day, Diesel was working at the docks. When Sir Topham Hatt sees how good I am, he bragged to the trucks, he'll get rid of steam engines once and for all. This gave the troublesome trucks an idea. As Diesel shunted them together, they started to sing. Is that all you can haul? Henry's loads are longer. Is that all you can haul? Henry must be stronger. Diesel was cross. He was sure that he was stronger than Henry. I'll push you all at the same time, he said. The trucks giggled. Push us all. That's the longest. Push us all. You'll be the strongest. That's me, said Diesel. The world's strongest engine. And Diesel shunted five trucks together, then ten, then fifteen. Soon he had an enormous line of twenty trucks. What's Diesel doing? cried Percy. He thinks he's the world's strongest engine, replied Thomas. Diesel didn't know the shunters had set the brakes on the trucks. The troublesome trucks knew, but encouraged Diesel to push anyway. Push, push, push! Diesel pushed, and he pushed, and he pushed. But the trucks didn't move, so Diesel decided to pull the trucks instead. Heave ho, heave ho, you can pull, but we won't go, sang the trucks. This made Diesel very cross. He pulled, and he pulled, and he pulled. Grease and oil, Diesel sulked, as the trucks laughed and laughed. <laughs> Sir Topham Hatt looked down crossly at Diesel. I thought you would be a proper dockyard Diesel, but I was wrong, he said. Can you make up for lost time, Henry? 
Oh, yes, sir, Henry replied happily. He backed up to the trucks and the shunters released the brakes. Then Henry pulled away as easy as pie. And the engines cheered. Diesel was sent home in disgrace. But the engines had learned a lesson. Even troublesome trucks can do you a favor sometimes, chuffed Thomas. Like getting rid of a smelly old diesel, puffed Percy. Hector the Horrid. Thomas the Tank Engine enjoys shunting troublesome trucks. He can biff them harder and faster than any other engine. It's one of his favorite jobs. One morning, Sir Topham Hatt had an important announcement. James and Edward must make extra deliveries of coal, he boomed. Thomas, you must shunt and fill freight cars at the coaling plant. James and Edward, you must collect them this afternoon. Thomas was very pleased. Just then, Bill and Ben chuffed by. Between them was a big black truck. It was biffing and bashing the little engines. What are you two doing, Tutor Thomas? Bill and Ben told him they were delivering the truck to the coaling plant. Why does it need two engines to deliver one truck, asked Thomas. Because he really doesn't like to be shunted, chuffed Ben. His name is Hector, huffed Bill, but we call him Hector the Horrid. Bill and Ben shoved slowly away with Hector. He does look troublesome, huffed James. Troublesome trucks don't worry me, boasted Thomas. I could biff him firmly into place. Later, Thomas chuffed into the coaling plant. And there was Hector. The other trucks giggled and laughed. <laughs> Big, bad, strong and solid. That truck's name is Hector the Horrid, they sang. Thomas puffed closer. Keep away, roared Hector. Bill and Ben were right, thought Thomas. Hector is scary, and Hector is horrid. Thomas decided to keep away. Thomas spent the morning shunting the other freight cars and filling them with coal. All the time, Thomas could feel Hector the Horrid watching him. The coaling plant manager came to see Thomas. We need an extra large delivery, he said, so Rosie is coming to help you. You must shunt and fill Hector. Then add him to the back of James's train, he told Thomas. Later, Rosie puffed into the yard. She saw Hector. Wow, do we have to shunt and fill that big truck, Thomas? She asked sweetly. Yes, puffed Thomas, but he doesn't want to be shunted. His name is... But before Thomas could finish, Hector opened his mouth and let out the biggest roar ever. Keep away! He bellowed. Rosie was so surprised she shook from funnel to footplate, and she steamed straight out of the yard. This made Thomas cross. Hector had biffed and bashed Bill and Ben. He had shouted at Thomas, and he had frightened Rosie so much that she had puffed away. Now the extra delivery would never be ready. Thomas had had enough. He puffed up bravely in front of Hector and gave him a mighty bit. Hector rolled backwards. He was very cross. Keep away, he roared. No, I won't, tooted Thomas crossly. You are causing confusion and delay. You really are horrid. Then, with one mighty bit, 
Thomas sent Hector rolling backwards into a set of buffers. Hector crashed off the track. Thomas felt very bad. He hadn't meant to knock Hector over. Thomas puffed up to Hector. Hector lay on his side, looking very sad. Now Hector didn't seem so horrid. I'm sorry I biffed you so hard, wished Thomas. But why don't you want to be shunted? Because I'm scared, moaned Hector. Why, asked Thomas. I'm new, he groaned, and I'm scared because I haven't been filled with cold before. I don't know what it feels like. That's why I didn't want to be shunted, he added. Thomas was surprised. Later, Rocky and the workmen arrived and lifted Hector back onto the tracks. Thomas wanted to help Hector. Sometimes I'm scared when I have to do something new, he chuffed, but coal isn't scary. Hector watched as Thomas rolled under the coal hopper. Black, dusty coal poured into Thomas's coal box. When the dust settled, Hector saw that Thomas was smiling. See? It's not scary, tooted Thomas proudly. Now Hector was excited. I'd like to be filled with coal too, he rumbled. We must hurry, puffed Thomas. Thomas pulled Hector quickly under the coal hopper. Hector was quickly filled with coal. It felt wonderful. Then Thomas shunted Hector into place, just in time. James and Edward puffed into the yard. They saw their waiting trains. James was very surprised to see Hector at the back. Well done, Thomas, snorted James. The trains were soon coupled up. James and Edward puffed away for their special deliveries. They were very surprised to hear Thomas whistle, good luck, but the whistle wasn't for them. It was Thomas tooting to his new friend, Hector the not horrid at all. <laughs>